Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty words, blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises as your people be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. And blessed be the Lord Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining, joining me and joining us in our online worship service here at the Georgetown Church of Christ. My name is Ryan Robertson and I am a Jesus follower like you who loves the Lord and calls on him as a redeemer, as a savior, as a Lord of my life. And each of us gives consent to his power you and I give consent to his protection and his provision for our lives. And so as you and I start today, I'd like to read a section from Psalm 18. I'm going to start reading in the beginning of the Psalm and then we're going to end. Verse one, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. The Lord lives down to 46. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God, my savior. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From a violent man, you rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you. Lord among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. I love that Psalm. It reminds me of who my God is. And it reminds you that these days, it's often difficult in our culture to turn off all that's going on, all the noise that surrounds us. But that's exactly what worship is intended to do. Worship is choosing to see the world we're in through spiritual eyes. It's a direct connection to the creator of the universe from wherever we are. So today, I admonish you, I invite you to allow the Holy Spirit into your living room, onto your couch and recognize that he's where you're at, he's here. So wherever you're watching or listening to this, by fully participating in the singing and the prayers and the communion and the teaching, and as we resume our in-person worship gatherings through these doors again on July 5th, we know some of you won't be able to join us in person just yet, but we still want you to tune in online, which it is the next best thing. So let me pray and then we'll get to our worship. Father God, thank you for moments like this. Thank you for times that each of us gets to speak to you that you gave us an avenue of prayer and that, Father, 
Your spirit is in us, beside us, in front of us, behind us. And Father, we love you and we thank you for moments where we get to worship. And even though we're doing it through a screen, you connect us through your spirit. Jesus, you said it's better for me to go away because I'm going to send the comforter. And spirit, you are here. So Father, thank you for your guidance through your spirit. Father, thank you for Jesus, for his direction, and for his example. So Jesus, Father, Spirit, thank you for moments like this again. And I pray that each one of us has a great worship time together as we center our hearts and our minds and our souls around you and your greatness. Jesus, in your name I pray, amen. All right, let's worship. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus come and heal my broken spirit i then obeyed his blessed commands and gained the victory oh victory in jesus my savior Oh, 
Now's the time for communion, so let's take about 30 seconds to gather our supplies and, and get prepared for communion. In keeping with our theme this summer, Summer in the Psalms, I'll be reading from the 40th Psalm. I'll be reading about through verse 6. This is a psalm written by David. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in Him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you have planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. I want to comment for just a second on uh, verse 6 there. It says, Sef sacrifice and offering you did not desire. You know, the religious, religious ritual of David's day involved sacrificing animals to, uh, in the tabernacle. David says these acts were meaningless unless done for the right reasons. And the same thing is true today. If we just make rituals of going to church and take the communion, these, these activities are also empty if our reasons for doing them are selfish. God doesn't want these sacrifices and offerings without an attitude of devotion. Jesus' last meal with his disciples took place during the celebration of Passover. Giving them bread, he said, Take, eat, this is my body. Next, he offered them wine from a cup. He told them, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. We read this in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. Believers today observe the Lord's Supper as a symbol of cleansing, of consecration, and communion. Jesus' blood cleanses us of sin. Starting with Adam and Eve, God required a blood sacrifice to cover transgressions. We read that in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. But this was just a temporary solution as the next offense required another sacrifice. Jesus was God's permanent answer to the problem. He took upon himself all sin, past, present, and future. 
and died to pay the full penalty. When a believer receives salvation, they are consecrated or set apart to the Lord. Their sins are forgiven. They receive eternal life as well as the indwelling Holy Spirit. But if at times they forget, and we all do forget, that we belong to the Lord, we may give in to temptation. The bread and the cup provide an opportunity to remember what the Father expects of His children and to renew one's com commitment to obey. The Lord's Supper is also a time to be in communion. We are connected not only with the Lord who saved us, but also, also with past and present believers. Among members of God's family, we find comfort and support, just as the disciples and the early church did. The Lord's Supper is a time to stop and recall what Jesus has given us. Let us partake solemnly and gratefully. Will you pray with me now, please? Father, we give our thanks for this bread which Jesus has told us represents his body. Help us focus our minds on the love that Jesus has for us and the sacrifice he made for us. In his name we pray, amen. Will you pray with me? Father, we give our thanks for this fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' blood that cleanses us from all sin. Forgive us, Father, and renew us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in the communion service today, and we hope the rest of the service is a true blessing to each one of you.
Good morning, church. I'm excited to talk to you today about Psalm 25. This piece of music, of artwork, has so much to offer so many. For me, this psalm is all about hope, and that is the perspective I'll be sharing with you today. I've spoken with some others this week who said, Greg, hope is only mentioned a few times. You know, that's the beauty of the psalms. There are multiple treasures that are buried in each one of the psalms, and they're not mutually exclusive. So I can give you my perspective, and maybe you'll get more out of it or something different out of it. My perspective is that this psalm is all about hope. David begins and ends the psalm with the words about hope and trust. But in the main body of the psalm, it's not quite as clear. In the main body of the psalm, I think he's discussing areas of his hope and trust. And he's making then requests of God based upon that hope of trust, and he's conversing with God. In this psalm, we will see that David put his hope in God. But specifically today, we will show from Psalm 25 that David put his hope in First off, God's supremacy, God's teaching and guidance, God's remembrance, and God's heart and relationship. First, before we go through this this breakdown of these categories, what is hope? Well, in simple terms, it's a thought or a feeling or an emotion that is optimistic about the future. I think we can generally all understand hope and conversely, hopelessness. I think we see that those are are times and situations where we see either a good outcome in the future or a lack of good outcomes. David mentions both hope and trust. This can be a little confusing. While these are largely interchangeable terms in this psalm, it might help us to remember that trust is really hope plus faith. Think of it this way. Hope is an optimistic desire, faith is believing that it will happen, and trust means that I not only want a good outcome, but expect it based upon the past, past actions or interactions. Hope plus faith equals trust or expectation. We know from Hebrews that faith gives substance or assurance to those things that are hoped for. It very much backs up the idea that hope plus faith equals trust or expectation. Many times, David was running for his life. He hoped for deliverance. He had a strong faith in God and God's ability to deliver and his willingness to do so. And so he put his trust in God for the outcome. There's much we could say and discuss about hope from the New Testament, but we're going to keep it simple. So first off, faith, hope is foundational. From 1 Corinthians, three things we are told last or endure. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Three pillars of Christianity that will endure. So obviously we need to explore those three. And today we're exploring hope. Also, that hope has work to do in our lives in good times and in difficult times. First, in Hebrews 6, we see that hope is an anchor for the soul, a steadying force against the waves of darkness and doubt. But we also see in Romans 15, where where it reads, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We could spend our entire time talking about this passage alone, but we won't. We'll simply note of that hope is a time for both good, it, it, it is appropriate. It's key to our desire to lay hold of joy and peace, that, that good times uh, hope, and we can see that in dark times, Hope is key as well, being that anchor for the soul. In Psalm 25, it is mostly a discussion of that anchor for the soul, how David could could see and seek deliverance from God and live in earnest expectation of that deliverance. Another big takeaway is that we can learn about how to talk to God. We can see from David how he conversed with God about his hope. We can learn how we ought to hope in God and converse with God on this topic. 
This is not a lesson on prayer, but it might as well be because so much of this is David talking to God and we get to listen in. We get to put ourselves in the story. Okay, so now we're just going to read through the psalm. If you have your Bible, it'd be good to read through it on your Bible as well, but we're going to have it uh, and we're going to read through the psalm. So starting with verse one, in you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. For shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are, my, for you are God, my Savior. And my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release me, my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve, my tr relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how numerous are my enemies and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life. And rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. My, may integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope, Lord, is in you. Deliver Israel, O God, from all their troubles. David puts his hope in God, but I see some categories here. First off, I see the category of God's supremacy, God's sovereign nature. David begins stating his trust in God and that no one who hopes in God will be put to shame. He uses the words Lord or Jehovah ten times to show his respect for God and his understanding of God's power. David says that God is able to deliver him from issues, enemies, and keep him from, the, from, from shame. This reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who said to Nebuchadnezzar, if God is willing, he is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. He is able to deliver us. Our God is a rock, a refuge. He's stronger than anyone or anything that we can place in front of him. David knew this, and our hope is in him. We see David leaning into God and his power and his supremacy. David uses a really cool technique I call the affirmative echo. Not only here in verse 3, but in verses 8 and 12, he does this same thing where he will make a request of God and then follow it with, far, with strong affirming statements. So he says, do not let me be put to shame. Then in the next verse, he says, no one who, who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. It would be like me going to Paul Partlow and saying, hey, Paul, uh, would you please lend me $100? Uh, I know that you're a good man. I know that you just got paid, and I know you lent Brian $100 last week. I may try that, by the way. We ask a question, then we back it up with a strong and affirming statement. 
In verses 4 and 5, he asked God to show me, teach me, guide me. But then in verse 8 and 9, he says, you instruct, you guide, you teach. He echoes the request with a strong affirming statement. Try this in your prayers. It might be something like, God, please give us today our daily needs and and bread and food. I know you can. You've done so all my life. I live knowing that you will do so again as a sign of your love and provision for me. It adds depth to our prayers. It reassures us, and it gives the glory to God. David's hope was in a God who was able to deliver. Next category I see is God's teaching and guidance. David says, I am teachable, God. Teach me, lead me, guide me. And then he has the echo statement where he says, I know you will. I know you can. And not only the law, but but your ways, your paths, your truths. I love that even David, living under the old covenant, wanted more than just salvation. He created you and I and all of creation. He knows how we should live. David's cry of, I am a sinner, forgive me, is followed up with, and help me to live better, to be better. So David's hope for the future was based on God's leading and teaching. God's remembrance is the next category. David knew God, but lived in expectation that God knew him and cared for him and remembered or regarded him. It's not like God forgot But keep me in mind. Keep me at the front of your consciousness, God. David asked for three things here. Remember your grace and mercy. Do not remember my sins, but remember me. Maybe he's thinking about Egypt in bondage for 400 years, and then Scripture says God remembered his children. Uh, Remember can mean uh, it is time for God to interact as he did with Noah and Israel. Do not leave me here, but deliver me. Think about me. David's hope was in a God who knew him and cared for him. God's heart and relationship is the next category I see. David showed that he believed God was on his side. He begins with the personal my God, and then in section the section he has on requests to God, He uses me, I, or my 17 times in verses 15 to 20. He's talking to God with whom he is familiar and who's familiar with him. He cries out to his God in expectation of deliverance. The ending of the psalm almost sounds like, I am waiting and trusting in your deliverance. David turns over to God his life, his reputation, his will, so that God might guide him. He asks for and trusts in God's forgiveness. His hope was based on a great relationship with God and a faith in the very goodness of God. All in all, this is pretty bold stuff, right? Reminding God of his covenant and expecting attention and action from the Almighty. We serve a really great God. David had hope, faith, and expectation that God would answer and deliver him and his country. Remember that although written by David, probably on the run, these psalms were compiled during Babylonian captivity and were most likely a picture of hope for the captives that they would someday be set free. The ending of the psalm probably gave them great hope. My hope, Lord, is in you. Deliver Israel, O God, from all their troubles. We already discussed many of the me, my's, and I's in verses 15 to 20. This is a very personal conversation. If you are praying the Psalms, this is where you would insert the cares of your heart. But look how personal it is. This is not a memorized dinner prayer of God, give us our food and God guard direct us. You may want to insert your own list here of cares and what's on your heart, But this is a pretty good list of issues to bring to God in prayer. Have you ever felt lonely? Trapped? Have a heavy heart? Felt hatred? Needing refuge or relief? Man, I have. God is where we can go for relief and understanding. God is a rock. He's our refuge where we can go and take our hope. The Psalms have a dark side to them, but that's the way of the world. Our hope is not in having the perfect life here, 
We will have dark days if we live long enough on this earth. David's understanding of God and his hope led him to believe that better days were ahead. And that is our hope as well. Maybe not here and now, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but in the end, we win. We are told that Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. We know that he lived in hope, in faith, in trust, that he would eventually be restored to the Father. That's exactly what got him through the crucifixion. Hope and his disciples, as his disciples, so should we. As both Jesus and David lived in hope in all seasons of life, so will I. I choose hope and not despair. I choose joy and peace and not sadness and conflict. I will fix my eyes on Jesus and live for the day he returns. Let's not put our hope in man, in governments, in ourselves, or in any other false god. Our hope is eternal. Pray Psalms 25 this week. Insert the cares of your heart. Talk to God. Get real with him. David did. Jesus did. So will I. Be blessed, church, and know that our God is able and willing to deliver us. Our God is a God of hope, and our hope is in him. Be blessed. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I hope you've been uplifted and encouraged by this virtual gathering. I want to take this time to thank everyone who donated to the Key to Free Supply Drive. We had such a great response, and I'm happy to say that the, their pantry is overflowing with needed supplies. Thank you to all who donated to this incredible organization. Second, I'd like to remind you all to fill out a worship service registration form that we've been sending out in the Friday email. 
Uh, we will also put a link to that form in the comments section below. Finally, as we continue this series in the Psalms, take some time to read and pray your way through the Psalms this summer. You will be blessed by the experience. As always, if you have a prayer request, have a question, want spiritual guidance, have a physical need, please let us know at the email address below. May God bless you this week, and I look forward to seeing everyone in person on July 5th. Oh, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. Death is defeated, and the King is alive.